Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Martin Hubel, and I'm the highly disorganized host of the DB2 Night Show uh, for uh, ZOS, the ZOS edition, and I'm uh, just in the middle of attempting to get everything organized here. Uh, today I have a special guest with me, uh, David Simpson of Themis Inc., who is uh, now back on the line. How are you doing today, Dave? Hey Martin, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> I am I am having great days here, and uh, I've actually just gone into presentation mode, which uh, my computer has decided needs to be on my other monitor. So uh, that should be popping up. It's amazing how things can eventually work out when you uh, put your mind to it. But uh, it's been one of those special days. I think the uh, busy fall and amongst all the other events in my life that have happened this fall, it's a sort of uh, I got here this morning, and I said, this is going to be a great show. And then I realized just how many different things can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're here, so uh, that is we'll a, count that as a win. That's a, that's a win. Uh, one thing I've learned in life is uh, one of the, the most important things as you get older is 50% uh, at least is just showing up. Uh, that, that applies to weddings, funerals, and other important things. Events in Physically your life. and mentally. Yes. Right. Well, the mentally is uh, is almost optional sometimes uh, with these days, but it, it just just being there is a, it's a big thing. So it was good to there see you. Go. It was good to see you last month in uh, Dublin. That was uh, one of the yeah, best I've done ever. What a great conference and a great venue. Uh, yeah. Had a great time. Yeah. I did, I, but I can honestly tell you, by the end of the week, I never thought this would happen, but I was actually sick of drinking Guinness, and I wanted to drink some other fine Irish products. Well, uh, they actually took us to the source, right? You, uh, yes, I did. and I've got the, They kept putting it in front of me, and I, I, I never told them no. Well, I drank a lot, uh, but I tried them all that night. I, they had different products, and I went up to the bar and had bottles of all sorts of things. It was fantastic. What, anyway. what a great trip, yeah. Anyway, let me let's move along and flip some slides. Uh, I still don't know where my polling questions went. It says I have zero polls, although I can see six set up correctly within go to uh, go to webinar. But again, it's these things in life like that that just make you go hmm. So uh, let me get. Uh, our, we have our standard uh, social media things we do for the show. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, Twitter, and we have a LinkedIn group. Occasionally, there's something important out there, but uh, we encourage people to ask questions through those uh, two uh, media and spread the word about the show. Uh, I think we are now up near, uh, this is the 65th show we've done on, on DB21Z, and we are up, uh, including all of the DB2.God talent shows that got numbered as LUW shows. I think we're well up around uh, 250 shows all told. It's uh, absolutely incredible. And it continues to roll along, and it continues to be very popular. And that's what, what, and the replays are such a great repository of just knowledge for people trying to find a, information on a topic. So absolutely. And one thing we've done in the last year or so, and uh, uh, once again you've uh, agreed to do it today, is to share your uh, PDF with the crowd and uh, the, the studio audience, and that's great, as well as with the uh, people in general. And we'll make that available following uh, in our uh, in our replay blog. So. Uh, please uh, go out and look for that. That's absolutely fantastic. It's another way of adding value to the community. And we're all about the community. And uh, unfortunately, I have to read this, but I'll do it as quickly as I can. The DB2 Night Show sponsors, advertisers, hosts, and guests in the respective organizations, if any, are not responsible for any liability or any content provided herein. Opinions and DB2 views are materialized in the viewer's mind only. Use information, ideas at your own risk. Use respect to courtesy when contributing to the DB2 Night Show via tweets, email, or as a guest. Trademarks and registered trademarks belong to the respective organizations. The DB2 Night Show is being recorded. Your participation may be recorded via your own, by, via your contributions, if any, and you consent to any and all content being recorded by your via your ongoing participation. Mind your manners. Recordings or derivative works thereof will be made available as replays. Replays, blogs, and related show materials are copyright 2015 DBI, all rights reserved. 
Wow, so I'm allowed to tell lies, huh? Ah, yes, you are. You can't hold me responsible. That's it. <laughs> we we all uh, we all try to tell the truth, and sometimes uh, we find out the truth has changed. But that's yet another matter. Do we? On this show, we, we do go for the truth. So um, yeah. uh, we've got some quick announcements, uh, studio audience polls, which will not happen today due to the mysteries of, uh, of the software that we use. I have no idea where they went. Golly. And those are so much fun, too. We love doing them. Um, then we'll have your, uh, uh, Dave, you'll get to do your talk. We'll have some Q&As. And by the way, that you can uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions questions as we go through um, and uh, I've got the Q&A tool and I'll, I'll uh, uh, break in from time to time and uh, uh, ask, answer, ask the questions of you to keep the show interactive so uh, uh, rather than just be making this uh, a dry presentation and uh, the next show we've got coming up uh, we've got one scheduled for uh, the 15th of January. It's, uh, uh, I'm trying to get uh, in touch with Willie. Willie said he'd do the show. We just have to come up with a topic. And uh, apparently he's working so hard and he's going to be leaving on vacation on Monday. So he's, he's, uh, it's been a real trouble getting in touch with him. He's apparently writing another Red Book, amongst other things. And it's nice to hear that Red Books are still coming. I heard some rumor that they, had, uh, they were dying, but it's nice to hear that that was uh, greatly exaggerated. So, uh, but Willie can talk about anything uh, uh, with very little provocation. He's just great. Um, the um, other thing for DBI is they're, they're, uh, they have, a, I guess, every other month they do a, a How to Tune uh, DB2 LUW in Minutes, and that's the uh, next one is on the 18th of February. We like to uh, uh, help them out by announcing what they're doing from our marketing point of view, and that uh, if you are you're running DB2 LUW, that will be informative to you. Um, I guess this is about the last time I'll be able to uh, uh, show this because they've announced new awards, but uh, Scott and I in uh, 2014 were given a big award. So now we're the, um, we are the uh, award-winning DB2 Night Show. I'm getting a big, I'm getting a hum from you. Is that, is that on my end? Because I am... Uh. Let me see if I'm... Uh, I'll mute myself and you can tell me. Yeah, it seems to be you. Oh. But uh, my other my other mic might be also be on here. I'm trying to uh, uh, see what I can do to... Uh, okay, my audio is on, on telephone on the other machine, so it's not me. You still getting it? I'm getting a little bit. It, there it's gone again. Okay. Uh, I haven't done anything. Oh my goodness! It, I think actually rip, wrapping the uh, microphone cord around your neck a couple of times has solved it for me in the past. <laughs> um, Is it better now? Uh, it's about the same. It's about the same. But I think we'll have to deal with that when you when you take over. Uh, my other uh, my other bit of, little bit of uh, humor today is putting up Charlie again. I've uh, been I've been missing a couple of shows this fall due to actually. Uh, I'm pleased to report work commitments where I was actually uh, in front of classes teaching. So that's uh, why Klaus Brandt has been filling in so capably for me. And I appreciate his help as a former host of the Z Show. He's been uh, 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 coming back to help help me out by, by filling in. So uh, that will happen from time to time. I do have some dates uh, teaching in the, in the spring, but I'll certainly uh, move to make sure that the weeks that I'm uh, traveling I, I will be around and I'm pleased to report so far this winter we have not had to put Charlie into his winter gear uh, he's got version 2 there on the bottom uh, and we'll uh, be using that shortly but right now we are going up to 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius depending on where you are today which is very unusual for Toronto so we're easily uh, somewhere between uh, 12 to 15 degrees above normal for this time of year don't have any snow, so it's rather dark at night, but uh, otherwise we're enjoying sunshine right now, and it uh, really feels kind of spring-like, so that's, uh, that's what we got there. Here are, our here are our sponsors again for the DB2 Night Show. We've got uh, uh, DBI, uh, Klaus Bronze Consulting and Ed Education. He runs the DB2 Symposium. I, Doug, of course, is 
always been a sponsor of our, uh, our DV2's Got Talent show by pre- pre- uh, presenting a badge. And we have an all about IDUG show coming up again this spring. Triton, Responsive Systems, and yours truly at the bottom. With all that, we are not going to do the polls because they have gone to poll land, or, well, maybe not to Poland, but uh, they are certainly not here. That was like a, a free free uh, slip of the tongue there. Uh, so we'll move on. And Dave, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we'll get on with today's presentation. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. We appreciate your uh, support of the Night Show and the DB2 community. And I just have to find the right link. And there you should have the thing on your on your screen now. Yeah, there we go. And uh, tell me when you can see my screen. I can see it now. Implementing expanded RBA. So, All right. A big bigger topic for people, so to speak. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no pun intended, or oh, no pun oh, intended. Yeah, oh. so. I, I never <laughs> I, I never miss a chance to for a, low, a bit of low humor. There you go. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Martin, and uh, the rest of the DB2 Night Show crew for inviting me today. Um, so the the expanded or extended RBA LRSN in version 11 non ZOS is is one of the I found among the, the clients that I visit one of the the biggest drivers towards early adoption of version 11. I guess I can't say early adoption anymore. We're kind of right in the heart of uh, where people are adopting, but uh, the folks that went <laughs> over the last couple of years, this was the thing they were trying to get to, um, by and large. Um, so uh, that's what I have prepared for this morning. Uh, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> we'll see how long this takes, but uh, uh, it actually this material comes from uh, the version 11 transition class uh, that that I do with Themis. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that in uh, in just a second. Um, so yeah, this is this is a little bit about me and or my company that uh, that I work for, uh, Themis Education. Uh, we deal in all kinds of IT topics, uh, but with a special emphasis on the mainframe, and with uh, you know within that a kind of a special emphasis on DB2. Um, so uh, you know most of our instructors, uh, the full time instructors that we have. Uh, teach DB2 topics of one kind or another. I kind of do end-to-end, so I can go all the way from uh, system-side stuff down to, uh, you know, SQL topics uh, and do kind of on a regular basis. So uh, um, it's a little bit about us. You can, uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be some links to find out more about us. Uh, So this is me um, and the uh, bio that I, I think I send to IDUG every year uh, that reminds them who I am. Uh, so I've been doing this DB2 thing since 1993. Um, you know, uh, went straight out of college to a shop that was in the middle of migrating all their legacy data into DB2. And uh, the legacy by legacy data, I mean like DDAM files with assembler access routines. Um, so you know, the best. Uh, uh, technology of the 1960s. Uh, they were taking it to the 90s in one step. <clears throat> so I got to uh, to help out with that and uh, and uh, work with them both as a developer and a DBA. Uh, also have a um, bunch of experience here in Chicago where I live at one of the big three credit bureaus. Uh, and again, lots of data. Um, uh, spent a bunch of time as a DBA there. For the last eight years or so, I've been doing this training consulting thing with Themis, and I really enjoy kind of going around the country, uh, or in the world, really. Um, as Martin said, we, we met each other in Dublin uh, last month, um, seeing how different people uh, do things in different environments. So I've been in uh, several shops already that are implementing version 11, and uh, uh, got to see kind of how they're going through that migration and how they're getting through the, the uh, extended RBA LRSN thing as well. So that's really where this uh, material comes from, uh, is you know my experience with those clients, and uh, uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from today. So we're going to talk a little bit about logging, just uh, at an overview. Um, we'll look at the basic and extended format. So so the basic format for the RBA is what you know all of you have been 
uh, used to forever, going back to uh, the beginning of DB2. Um, so now they're they're giving us the ability to expand the RBA and LRSN, you know, adding four bytes to it. Um, and uh, I think that uh, IBM has been very wise in how they've given us in the tools they've given us to implement this change. I, I think in releases past we've gotten similar changes where they said to us, um, you know, don't worry about it. It'll be a seamless change. It'll be a you know, you don't really need to think about it too much. Um, but that's not the tack that they've taken here. They've given us a ton of control over how it happens and the order in which you choose to do it. Uh, and there's some uh, advantages and disadvantages to the different uh, ways you may, or the different orderings you may choose to do the steps. And uh, that's one of the things I'll try and talk about uh, here today. So the, the process of converting from small RBAs to big RBAs um, is pretty straightforward, uh, but again, we want to uh, we want to talk about the different options they've given us for for getting there, and and again, the real the real goal here is <clears throat> to not be getting to the point where you run out of these things. Right, so uh, uh, we'll talk about that. All right, so um, RBAs and LRSNs, so logging in DB2 is tracked uh, by a relative byte address. Uh, for a single, for every DB2, you know, standalone system and every member of your data sharing group uh, has it, its uh, its own system for tracking how much log has happened. And so when uh, it, it's it really can be correlated to a point in time. Right. So basically, when you put up a DB2 system, the RBA is at all zeros. As log starts happening, it's tracking the address of that log entry. You know, since the beginning of time. Um, so if you are on a standalone DB2 system that's not very active, uh, then you know you can go um, many, many, many years uh, without this becoming a problem. Um, if you're on a, a very active system, then it, it becomes a problem, and it can actually become a problem on a kind of alarmingly frequent basis. I, I heard, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the legends back in the day when they first invented this and they figured out how big this RBA needed to be to avoid ever hitting the end of it. Uh, and they did some calculations, you know, at the time, and it was obviously based on some assumptions about, you know, how fast you could write things to disk and everything. This is back in the 80s. And they figured that they would never in any of our lifetimes, you know, run out of these addresses. Um, and now there are some companies uh, that can do it in a matter of just a couple of years, um, you know, can, can run through. Um, all of the available RBA addresses. So I think it's a matter of hardware has um, gotten faster and the amount of work that we expect a DB2 to do uh, has has gotten, um, uh, has gone up on a ridiculous scale. Right, so these things uh, in the beginning were six bytes and they are still six bytes if you're not on version 11 yet. Uh, so an RBA can tolerate 256 terabytes of log over the life of a DB2 subsystem if you ever uh, go beyond that. Uh, and that's not necessarily log that you're keeping, right? Most of you aren't actually keeping 256 terabytes of log. That's like 256 terabytes ever, right, since the, the DB2 subsystem was put up. Um, and if you ever, you know, get too close to the end of that, then you have, uh, um, you know, some mild trauma in your organization, um, and we'll talk a little bit about you know the old ways of dealing with that in a second. Um, but now in version 11, uh, probably the the solution you want to implement uh, over the last couple of years would be get yourself to version 11 where you can expand it and and not have to run into that problem. Uh, LRSN is a little bit different. So LRSN is the um, metric that's used to coordinate log entries across. Uh, subsystems in a data sharing group. Right? So if you if you have data sharing going, you've got multiple members up there. Each of them has their own RBA. We can't do um, recovery uh, to point in time, or we can't track log at a particular point in time based on any one of the individual RBAs going on. We need a, a way to coordinate across the, the sub or across the the group, across the plex, uh, and LRSN is the way that is is um, accomplished. LRSN is actually based on the clock. Right? So you can take an LRSN or Larsen, uh, some people call this, 
you can take a Larson value uh, and with a little bit of calculations figure out you know exactly what day and time it is. Um, it is not based on how much log is happening, but actually on what time it is, right, or what, what date and time. So based on the timestamp down to uh, a fairly decent amount of precision. Um, the LRSN for everybody, well, almost everybody, uh, is going to run out in 2042 um, with some exceptions. And the exceptions tend to be how you went to data sharing uh, and the member that you used to take yourself to data sharing, what was its RBA uh, at the time you went. So uh, um, there is an offset to Larson in some cases that will make people run out sooner than 2042. So we have like a little another Y2K crisis coming in, uh, you know, 25 years or whenever, 20, 27 years, whenever that is, um, that, uh, you know, uh, barring an expansion, uh, we'll have to deal with. Now, if you run out of RBAs, um, there's a couple of ways to deal with that. If you're not data sharing, uh, you go through a cold start, you reset it to zero, all your recovery information gets invalidated, you got to back everything up again. Um, if you're data sharing, uh, you pretty much uh, just retire the member and put up another one. Right? So uh, we, 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 uh, you can retire the member that's running out of, out of addresses and, and go with a new one. Um, LRSN, there's no, there's no resetting it. It's based on the clock. And when we get to 2042, we're going to be at high values in, on the Larson. So uh, you know, you got some, you got to do this before 2042 uh, at least, right? All right. So version 11 uh, in new function mode of DB2 allows for an extended or 10 byte RBA LRSN instead of the six bytes that you have today. Uh, the conversion process to, to be fully um, extended RBA requires updates to the bootstraps of, of every member of your group. Uh, the DB2 catalog, and then every application table space and index. If you look in your, if you do DSN1 prints on any table space or index that you've got in your shop, uh, you'll see that every page has in its header uh, RBAs uh, that tell DB2 when the last time this thing was updated. So um, it is, uh, uh, it takes act to, in order to expand this thing, uh, really, every page of every object uh, needs to be touched, uh, and we're going to do that with some uh, reorg utilities. Th this conversion can actually be done at your discretion. You don't have to do it all at once, um, and you can do the steps, you know, the bootstrap, the catalog, and the um, application objects in any order that you want, but there are, again, some kind of performance and logistical consequences of the order that you choose, which we'll talk about in just a second. All right, so today, this is pre-version 11, um, DB2 has some messages that it starts kicking out for you when you're getting close, right? So DSNJ032i uh, will be thrown to your console and into master uh, if you ever get to an RBA that starts with, uh, with Fox. Right? And it'll start issuing these warnings on a sort of regular basis to tell you hey, look, you're, uh, you're sort of close to the end here. Um, if you ever get to Fox, 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 and you haven't taken any action, uh, DB2 starts issuing uh, the same message. I think, actually, it's not an I in the end anymore. It's an, an E. Um, and DB2 uh, will not start. All right, so um, uh, they're leaving you a few <laughs> little, uh, a few bytes at the end there to be able to come up in maintenance mode, do your final cleanup, and do the cold start. Um, but they basically shut down access to applications um, if you ever get to uh, four leading um, Fs in your, in your current RBA. Okay, so this is the way things behave today or prior to version 11. When you get to version 11, actually, those messages um, change a bit, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, you might notice when you, and some of you may already be on version 11 conversion mode or new function mode, when you m migrate to version 11, any, any flavor of version 11, uh, you'll see DB2 start talking to you in these extended RBAs. So uh, this is just a, a, a dump out of DB2 master um, for a log, you know, a log switch. 
you know, active log data sets full, it moves to the next one, and it gives you the starting and ending RBAs of the, the log files. Uh, these are being expressed in 10 byte RBAs, even though this system that I'm working with here is only um, conversion mode and hasn't even gone through the conversion yet. So internally, when you get to version 11, DB2 is thinking, talking, recording in memory 10 byte RBAs, even if you haven't actually physically made that conversion yet. It's just going to zero pad the left side of the RBA. So you'll see the instrumentation and the messaging start talking to you in, in terms of the longer RBAs immediately, as soon as you go to version 11 conversion mode. Um, and in utilities and things, if you say, you know, recover to RBA, you can actually use either one. Right? You, can, you can specify a 6-byte or a 10-byte RBA, uh, and it will figure out what you meant. Uh, that, of course, until you actually go beyond <laughs> the 6-byte RBA, uh, then you're going to have to start talking to DB2 and 10 byte RBAs also. Right, so uh, um, DB2 also, the instrumentation and messaging always speaks in terms of the larger RBAs. As soon as you're on version 11, whether or not you've taken any action to actually get there. Um, so let's see what they've done um, with these extra bytes. Um, let's start talk RBA first, uh, which is pretty easy. So there I have an existing RBA. Uh, that starts with Charlie. So on this particular system that I pulled this one from, you know, we're getting up there. We're not dangerously close to the end, um, but we've used, you know, looks like more than three quarters of the available RBAs. So we're going to have to take action at some point in the not terribly distant future. Uh, when I go to the expanded or extended RBA format, it's just going to throw four extra bytes on the leading edge uh, of that RBA. So now I've got. Um, you know, orders of magnitude more um, more uh, log to address, um, and so I think every, that's pretty easy to to understand. Uh, on the Larson for data sharing, um, they actually have done something pretty cool here. On the left, they they put one of the new bytes on the left side, which if you do the math on this, it actually gives us thirty thousand years more <laughs> clock until we run out of uh, LRSNs. Um, so putting extra bytes on the left side, putting more of the extra bytes on the left side was not doing us any good. They, they add one of the bytes to the left side, we get 30,000 years. Uh, and I think that uh, every one of us is not too concerned uh, about uh, you know the Y2K problem that we're apparently going to have in 30,000 years. Actually, we're going to have a Y10K problem before that with dates again. Um, but uh, again, you know, the, the goal is always to fix the to push the problem beyond the point when I'm going to be you know working here, and so uh, 30,000 years should do it. Uh, what they've done with the extra bytes, the, the other three bytes on the Larson, is they've stuffed them on the right side. So what that does is gives us more precision. And it completely solves the issue of, uh, of, of Larson spin that you sometimes have in data sharing. Now, they've taken the last several releases of DB2 have addressed Larson spin in, in a couple of different ways. Um, and, and basically, the issue is there, comes, there, there are times when you, DB2 requires a unique Larson for a particular event in the log. And because this is based on the clock and because the... Um, the actual system clock is pulsing faster than uh, we have Larson values to represent. Um, you actually sometimes have will will get two events that get the same Larson, and DB2 requires a unique one, so it will actually sit in the CPU and spin, waiting for the clock to advance. So this is actually a data sharing performance issue that's been around for a long time. Um, they've taken steps to address it in the last couple of releases of DB2, mostly by reducing the number of events that require a unique Larson. Well, now they've kind of completely solved the problem by giving us way more precision on the right side of that, of that Larson. So when you convert to the, to the bigger extended RBA and Larson, um, you're also solving a, um, um, a potential data sharing performance issue. So uh, um, all kinds of incentive 
uh, to, to get to this uh, extended RBA LRSN. Number one, we won't run out of RBAs as much on our standalone and individual DB2 subsystems. And in data sharing, uh, we won't have the, the Larson spin issue that's been a problem forever. So uh, those are some good reasons, I think. Um, in version 11, um, we, the concept of um, uh, you know, running out of these things becomes a little bit different. Um, if you have not yet converted to the extended and you get to a value of Fox, Fox, Fox 8, or if you get within two months of the actual LRSN max, um, the objects you haven't yet converted will be marked as read only and uh, the utility table spaces if they, in the catalog and directory, if they have not yet been converted, uh, then it'll basically shut off your access to run utilities. Uh, if now instead of having a place where DB2 just shuts down, um, if you get to the actual end of the RBA or the actual end of, of Larson, um, you're going to end up with soft limit restrictions still and if your bootstrap hasn't been converted by this point, then DB2 will shut down and not start. Um, and you basically you have to convert the bootstrap at that point, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Okay. But you don't get to these. Um, <laughs> the, the, these are more like warning conditions now than, than actual like crisis kind of errors. It means you just have to take some action. Um, and if you're in a, you know, if this is a production environment, you probably are still, <laughs> it's still a big problem, but it's pretty easily solved. Let's talk about uh, the steps. You know, once your version 11 new function mode, now the first thing I guess I need to say is that all of this, can, none of this can happen before your new function mode. The enabling new function mode process is actually going to do some work to the DB2 catalog that preps you for this. So everywhere in the catalog that stores uh, an RBA value needs to be expanded, right? Um, so the, you know, it's particularly things like syscopy, but there's there's all manner of places you, uh, um, in the catalog where it keeps track of an RBA, uh, and those have to all be expanded for to, to hold a bigger number. Um, and so that actually happens in the NFM process. The catalog is prepped for this. Um, once you're in new function mode, then we've got three basic steps to getting fully converted to the uh, extended RBA LRSN. Uh, the first is the bootstrap. Uh, and they provide a, a, a sample job in uh, SDSN SAMP called DSNTIJCB. DB2 has to be down for this. Uh, it only runs uh, for a few minutes, even on a fairly large, you know, it's really just working on your bootstrap. And if you look at the steps in there, it's just making a copy of the bootstrap. Um, you know, re, uh, running this conversion process on it and then renaming them. So, uh, it, and it runs, DB2 does have to be down. You can cycle through your members if you're data sharing, you know, and do them one at a time. Um, but DB2 does have to be down for this, but the process is very fast. Okay. Um, that third sub bullet under that one is kind of important. Once you've done this, any warnings that you were getting that said, hey, you're almost out of RBAs, those stop. Even though your subsystem isn't necessarily totally safe, well, the subsystem is totally safe at this point, but not every object in it is totally safe. I'm going to go back a slide. Oops. I'm trying to go back a slide. Yeah, so the, the, um, these restrictions that you see, you know, are still in effect. In other words, if I haven't converted all my objects, um, some of them may, may end up going into read only, right? Um, but once I've converted the bootstrap, you know, there's no point where DB2 is actually not able to run. Just a bunch of my objects might be in read only status, which is kind of interesting. And the warnings stop. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. Because just because we're not getting warnings anymore doesn't mean we're totally safe. It does mean that the DB2 subsystem will not be at a point where it can't start. Okay. Um, another step is to actually convert the catalog and directory. Now the catalog and directory, I said a minute ago, a bunch of stuff happened during the NFM process. That was actually expanding the columns in the catalog to be able to hold bigger RBAs. But the catalog itself, 
the catalog and directory themselves are recoverable objects that have RBAs and LRSNs in their header in the header of every page that also need to be converted. Okay, so uh, there's a sample job for that as well, DSNTIJCV, and running that job will involve you know a, a online reorgs of the entire catalog and directory. Uh, you shouldn't need an application outage for this. This job could run a while, depending on how big your catalog is. Um, but this is actually, for recovery purposes, converting the catalog and directory uh, to use the, the larger addresses. Um, you also need to convert all of your application objects, table spaces and indexes. And we do that typically with the reorg utility. Now, um, the examples I'm going to show you are going to use the IBM reorg utility. If you have third-party utilities, you might want to take a, a peek at them and make sure your vendor uh, supports this conversion or ask if the vendor supports it, and if so, you know, what you need to do. But I'm going to show you IBM examples here. Okay. Um, so here I'm running a DSN JU004, um, printing the bootstrap. So I can tell whether a bootstrap has been converted just by running this utility on it. Um, you, you know, DB2 doesn't have to be down for this. It's just actually uh, a standalone, you know, offline DB2 utility that'll dump the bootstrap into a, uh, a printable form. Uh, this particular one has not yet been converted to the bigger RBA, but it's interesting. It's still showing me bigger RBAs down here. Um, I think that's kind of interesting, right? Remember the instrumentation and all the utilities and everything start talking bigger RBAs even before that's reality. Well, what's reality here? Uh, this second line says the DSN JCNVT conversion program has not yet been run. Um, what about that first line? DSN JCNVB has run. <laughs> well, if you remember, for those of you who have done system work, back in about version 8, um, was the last time they had to expand the bootstrap for any reason. They basically gave you um, the ability to track bigger logs and more logs. Um, that was the last conversion program that needed to be run on the bootstrap. I think they made you do that before you went to version 10. Uh, you, you were able to do it on 8, and then by the end of 9, you had to do it. Um, so you're still getting that message that says, okay, you ran that one back in the version 8 time frame, but you haven't run the version 11 one yet. Okay. Even though it looks like I'm seeing bigger RBAs, which is kind of interesting. That's just the utility actually showing me a bigger RBA, even though it's not uh, yet reality. Okay. So you're looking for this message right here to determine whether a bootstrap has actually been, in fact, been converted. Okay. Um, from the application object perspective, you can use reorg, load, replace, or rebuild index. Um, the format for new objects, so if you go out and create a new table space after your version 11 new function mode, um, whether it's in the old or the new format will be determined by uh, the value for zparm object create format. Um, one of the other things that I, I needed to talk about, um, neglected to mention a second ago, let me go back a couple of slides here. These three steps can be done in any order. So you can convert your application objects, or some of them, before the bootstrap has been converted. Um, you, convert, you can convert catalog and directory before the bootstrap's been converted. Um, I think the order that I've listed here is kind of typical, and I think it's probably what IBM expects, but they don't demand it. So uh, it probably makes sense to convert the bootstraps first and then do the catalog and directory and then do your application objects. But again, we're not forced into that order. Um, the issue with converting, so, so there, there are some ramifications of what order you choose to do them in, though. If you convert the bootstrap first, um, then you can actually accelerate your pace toward the end. So if you're really, really close to the end of RBA and you convert the bootstrap, you may actually get there faster. Um, and when I, you know, why do I care about that? Well, I may not have converted all my application objects yet at this point. Right? Why would you get there faster? Well, because the log entries themselves store RBAs, store the value for the RBA, the log records that get cut are a little bit longer 
once you've converted the bootstrap than they were before. And because the log records are longer, you're using more log. <laughs> because you're using more log, the RBA uh, goes up uh, a little bit faster than it used to. Okay, so uh, you may want, if you're very close to the end, um, you know, if you're kind of trying to get to 11 quickly so that you don't hit the end of this thing, you may want to hold off converting the bootstrap until you're really re very close to ready to convert your application objects as well. If I go the other way, if I say I'm going to convert the application objects first and then do the bootstrap, then you're incurring a little bit of overhead and a little bit of extra overhead in logging because now when you, uh, um, you have an object that has a longer RBA but the log is not yet ready to receive that longer RBA, DB2 has to kind of back backwards convert the RBA to the smaller one. So there's a little bit of overhead with doing table spaces first um, and then the downside of doing the, the bootstrap first is that you might accelerate your pace to the end. Okay, so some things to think about. If you want to talk a little bit more about how that works out in practical, um, uh, you can shoot me an email. I have an email out there at the end, uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, so the application objects, um, we said the, the zparm object create format determines how new objects are created. So if I create a new table space, is it going to be basic or extended? Um, if you set the zparm to extended, then every new table space you create as soon as you're on new function mode, will be extended format even if you haven't created the or, or converted the bootstrap or whatever. Um, we can also set a zparm called utility object conversion that will affect the default for reorg load and rebuild. Um, you have four choices there. Um, none means, you know, <laughs> if I do a reorg on an object and uh, it was basic format and I don't specify anything on the reorg control card, then keep it basic. If it was already extended, then keep it extended. Don't do any conversion by default. Um, I think probably after your bootstrap is converted, it might make sense to set the CPARM object utility conversion to extended, meaning as the normal course of reorg start running, they will convert your objects to extended. Okay, whether or not the DBA re running the reorg asks for it. We can also explicitly ask on a control card for, in, a, in a reorg in this case, um, please set my RBA LRSN conversion to extended. So I'm reorging an object here. This overrides whatever's on the zparm. And you'll see messages come out of the reorg that are shown below there that say uh, these objects, this object and all of its indexes have been converted by the keyword to the extended format. Um, the zparm also has this other option called no basic. Uh, and that basically <laughs> says, um, I think this is IBM uh, giving us this option for, you know, someday when uh, the basic RBA is going to actually go away. No basic says the reorg will convert you to extended RBA and you can't override it at the utility control card level. Okay, so you do get converted to extended regardless of what you're asking for on the control card. So there's control card here. I can say extended. I can say basic. So if you convert an object to extended and you have a problem, you can convert it back to basic with just another reorg. Um, so they're giving you some some nice things to put on the change control form that says, you know, what's your backup plan. Okay. Um, here's just a couple of miscellaneous considerations. Um, when you um, install a, um, a new DB2 subsystem, <laughs> the bootstrap comes up uh, even in version 11 as basic format, which this really surprised me. I put up my first, you know, sandbox version 11 when I first got a hold of it. And it was months later that I realized really all of my objects were in extended format, but the bootstrap was still basic. So you actually do have to run DSNTI JCB on a new DB2 subsystem on the bootstrap to get it to extended format, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Um, you might want to actually just put this in your, you know, installation job stream if you're putting up a new subsystem to get it done right away before anything happens in it. Okay, new, ins new install, the catalog is already extended by default. Um, you know, unless you're close to the limits, maybe plan a gradual conversion after NFM. Um, so, you know, make a plan. You could even make this part of your migration plan. All right, what are we going to do? You know, when are we going to convert the bootstraps? When are we going to do the catalog and directory? When are we, how are we going to get um, our application objects uh, through all those reorgs? 
Uh, performance degradation can happen if the bootstrap is basic but the objects are extended. So that can play into um, you know, how you decide to uh, order each of the steps. Uh, we say performance degradation here. We're talking um, fairly minor, you know, two or three percent, I think, is the number I've heard uh, thrown out there. Um, but if you're not real close to the end, then you may you may want to do the bootstrap first so that you can avoid this. And you want to think about those two Z-parms and uh, how they're going to play into your conversion plan. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one, too. I've had a couple of clients run into this. If you have a table space that's really close to its, its DS size or close to its, its maximum size, this larger RBA means that you actually get 18 fewer bytes of data on every page because the, the RBA actually uh, is, there's a couple of RBAs in the header of every page. So the header expands and you have less data on every page for data, or less space on every page for data. Um, if you're close to your DS size, then the rear could actually cause you to exceed it. All right, so we need to be a little bit careful there. Um, the instrumentation, uh, including IFKID 306, which a lot of people use for, for um, uh, replication kind of tools, uh, starts showing you larger RBAs as soon as you go to version 11 before any actual conversion. So this is why um, some uh, tooling, especially uh, data propagator or whatever we call that today, information integrator, you have to be at current releases of that before you even go to conversion mode because it has to be ready from an instrumentation perspective to, uh, to be able to deal with the bigger RBA. And as always, you want to deal with your third parties. Right? Check any third party tools that are sensitive to RBAs like log analysis tools, replication, <clears throat> backup and recovery. You know, obviously all of them need to be ready for the, uh, the, the expanded RBA. Um, you do have some catalog support for this in SysTable part and index part. Um, there is a column called RBA format. Oh, notice this is at the partition level too. Um, this is a very good thing. The fact that this is at the partition level means you can do your reorgs at the partition level. So in other words, I don't have to uh, reorg the entire object uh, to convert it from basic to extended. I can, I can do it at the partition level and it's tracked at the partition level. So you can actually have a table space <coughs> that has some partitions in basic and some in extended. Um, I've had some of my clients report that that actually is a problem if you leave it that way over a long period of time. So I would, if you're going to convert a table space that's partitioned, you know, go ahead and convert all the parts. But the good news is you can do it at the partition level. You don't have to get the whole object into one big reorg. Okay. Um, the RBA format in the catalog will tell you what the format is. Um, there's a note there that says it might not be correct if you've done some things like DSN one copy. Right. So if you've taken um, a, a table space that's in basic format and DSN one copied it into one that was extended format, then the catalog will be wrong. DB2 figures this out, so that's not a problem. In other words, this column is really for informational purposes. It's not, DB2 doesn't use this to determine how to access the table space. Um, it knows looking at the header um, of the table space, the header page, what format it's in. Um, but there is, uh, this catalog column could be incorrect for reference purposes. There's also a repair that you can run to uh, set that correctly. Right. So that is all I have to say um, for the moment anyway. Uh, these are some ways that you can find me. Uh, email, Twitter, and uh, the website for my company there. You'll find more about what I do and uh, um, would love to uh, have continue the discussion with any of you who would like to uh, afterwards via email or Twitter or however you want to get a hold of me. Great job, Dave. Uh, I was just going to mention that uh, when I was around in uh, uh, 1985 or six, when this uh, the RBA was first uh, set up, uh, IBM said that if you were writing 100 bytes per second to the DB2 log, it would last 44 years. That was the original size. <laughs> okay, so actually we're getting sort of close to that, but uh, yeah, it's interesting though that. I mean, I have a couple of clients that say they, you know, and these are clients that have dozens of subsystems, but they, every six months they have one to do or so, oh. you know, a couple a year. 
oh for sure uh, where they have to have to reset so we're spinning through these uh, in in just a matter of uh, of months or a couple of years now instead of instead of the 40 <laughs> yeah. uh, that was projected so yeah it's a great reason to get to 11 uh, to end that headache for forever and then about other ones and the DB2 version 12 they're adding a it seems an extra uh, bite to the uh, to the rid so we'll be able to handle larger uh, tables as well so that's uh, blow through some some other limit upper limits yeah, yeah. all righty well that's uh, a great job as always and uh, being a member of the Speaker Hall of Fame. Are you also an information champion and other things like that? Uh, I am an information champion. So uh, you can find me uh, um, on Developer Works. I think there's a profile for me there as well. Right. I'm just uh, looking for the attendees here. Where, where did they end up? I'm, uh, I'm having a day. I am having a day. There we are. I need to take control back over here and make. Yeah, I was trying to give it to you, but uh, having, no, no, having my own issues. I am, I am, <laughs> there you I go. am the guy uh, that I have there you to go. do it. There we are. And uh, what I need to do now is just make sure that people are. Oh, look at this! I think, I think half of this, uh, Scott got involved with my deck or something. Because that, did you notice how that changed color three times there? That was impressive. It was beautiful. Yeah, it does it again. Look at that! Wow. I'm just really impressed, and uh, I'll I'll get the uh, audio up later today on the website. You'll be able to download a copy of it along with a copy of uh, Dave's PDFs. I have that in hand, but uh, the same thing that is preventing me from uh, running polls today and asking people what people thought of the show, as we normally end at the end, we ask people if they learned anything. I also am unable to add handouts, so I've got a couple of. Uh, Things I've got to talk over with uh, with Scott and with uh, the uh, Citrix people is to find out why that was. But uh, at this point, we will end five minutes early today, which is great, probably due to the uh, fact I didn't run five minutes of polls. Uh, thanks again, Dave, for your contribution to the show and to the DB2 community. And, uh, and uh, I'll sign off. Play the Cue the music. Thanks for having me, and, uh, and uh, I guess I'll be in on the panel that we have next week, right? So yes, we're having we'll our. Back for that. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. There. Thanks for bringing that up. We do have our annual eggnog party next week, and that means that every expert we've ever had on the show, and any other people we'd like to have on the show, or would think of coming on the show, we'll have a few minutes or a minute or two to say what they. Uh, uh, what they've enjoyed in the last year about DB2 and what they're looking f forward to next year. So that'll uh, give everybody a, a chance to hear from, from the entire DB, or, uh, the active people in the DB2 community. So please join us for that next week. It will be a great show. Take care. Uh, cue the music. And we are off to the races. Have a great weekend, one and all. And, uh, Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye-bye.